بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد when Ali al-Akbar alayhi salam was killed Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam threw his blood into the air but none of it came back he then gathered the pieces of his son's body, gathered them in a piece of cloth, and asked for some of his family members to come and help him so he was able to return the body back towards the tent. When the ladies of Al Muhammad السلام, saw Imam Al Hussein السلام, bring the cloth with the pieces of Ali al-Akbar's body they all began at that moment to shed their tears they began to wail they began to beat their chests and they began to expose their hair and amongst them was Zainab alayhi salam after Ali al-Akbar alayhi salam the first to go out was Abdullah the son of Muslim bin Aqil he came out towards the opposition on the battlefield and he said today will be the day I'll meet Muslim and he is my father and a group of the others who've been killed on the path and the religion of the Prophet when he came out on the battlefield he waged three different attacks against the opposition army until Yazid bin Ruqad al-Juhani came forward to strike him when he noticed that he was about to strike him he placed his hand in front of his forehead but the arrow hit his hand and his forehead and now his hand was stuck to his forehead he then at that moment called out oh Allah they've outnumbered us and they've humiliated us so kill them in the way that they've killed us as he was trying to remove his hand at that moment Yazid came forward bin Ruqad al-Juhani and struck a spear into his heart he fell at that moment into the ground and when he fell on the ground his cousins from the line of Abu Talib alayhi salam all of them suddenly ran out onto the battlefield ready to fight the opposition four of them ran out which made Imam al Hussein alayhi salam call out be patient O oh my cousins when you face death i promise you'll never see a difficulty after this the four that came out the first of them was Aun, son of sayyida zainab alayhi salam the second of them was muhammad the third of them was abdul rahman the son of aqil and the fourth of them was muhammad the son of Muslim bin Aqil when Aun came out he looked towards them and he said in Tunkiruni fa'ana ibn Ja'fari 
ان تنكروني فانا ابن جعفر شهيد صدق في الجنان الازهري The first of our loud salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. A second even louder salawat in honor of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. A third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. 1.35 p.m. and now begins the test for the mothers of Bani Hashim. One by one, these mothers have seen the companions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam from 9.30 a.m. until about 1 p.m. give their life away. And now the mothers on the 10th of Muharram have to ask themselves a question. Who are they going to give towards the path of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? No doubt, this particular period is a lesson for all of us, but especially for the mothers. On the first level, you see mothers who are raised on the who raise their children on the love of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. You see their children on the tenth of Muharram. Many times, we only mention a handful of those children of Bani Hashim. If I was to ask the majority of the Shia in the world. Tell me about who of the children or who of the youth died in Karbala. You'll see the most famous names who emerge are normally Qasim, Aoun, Muhammad. And after that, many of us do not mention the others of Bani Hashim who died. Bani Hashim lost around 28 members. And of those, there was a great contingent who were still very young. As in when you look, at the numbers who were there, there were some who were 9 who went forward, some who were 11 who went forward, some who were 14 who were dying to go forward. They were begging their uncle Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. That could only come because of the fact that their mums had raised them on the love of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. That the best of mothers will always be the ones who bring up their children on the love of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. All of us here are indebted in one way or another to the milk of our mother, no doubt. The milk of our mother and the way our mother has raised us is the reason that we have this passionate love for Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. You look around the world and you see people who are able to stop everything in their life just to do ziyarat al-Hussein alayhi salam. For that reason, you find that the first lesson that emerges from the outset at 1.35 p.m., is that the mothers and of them the greatest being Zainab alayhi salam are about to show their ultimate love to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. They are about to give everything they have because many times people ask why did Imam al Hussein alayhi salam take these ladies? Why didn't Imam just leave these ladies for example in Medina or in Mecca? You could have left for example Sayyidah Zainab Alayhi salam, you could have left your sister Ruqayya, the wife of Muslim bin Aqil, alayhi salam, because you know Muslim bin Aqil and Imam al Hussein are not just first cousins, but they are brother in laws. Ruqayya, the wife of Imam al Hussein, the sister of Imam al Hussein, why didn't you leave her behind? Why didn't you leave Umm Kulthum behind? But not just them, how about these young daughters? You could have left them behind. It's as if Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was saying that these ladies are the ones who will ensure that Karbala will never be forgotten. They are the ones who will ensure, and that's why one poet famously said, that had Zainab alayhi salam been at Ghadir, then everyone would have remembered Ghadir. In one way, you look at Zainab alayhi salam, and what she gave, and Umm Kulthum, and what she gave, and Rabab, and what she gave, and the other ladies, the best way to understand them is by looking at each of their children on the 10th of Muharram. Our mosques have done a disservice to the children of Imam al Hussein and his family on the 10th of Muharram. That it's a shame that if you ask many of us to name the brave youths of Karbala, many of us only know two or three. So what happened to all the others who were there? That's a disservice to them, a disservice to their mothers 
who raise their children. Number two, look at those children's akhlaq on the 10th of Muharram. Listen, we all know one word and it's called cranky. A person, when they get cranky, where's my water? Where's my food? I want water. I want food. I want this. Why is it hot? Why is Iraq hot? Why is Karbala hot? Get cranky. Why is it so hot? Where's the AC? And so on. You look at the children on the 10th of Muharram, impeccable discipline. Impeccable. There's not one moment where their children will turn around, for example, and get angry or rude with the parents. On the contrary, think about the 10th of Muharram and you'll see the way they talk to one another and the way they talk to their mom and the way they talk to their dad. Highlighting love of Hussein is one thing, but akhlaq of Hussein has to complement as well. There are many who bring up their children as azadars. MashaAllah, that's a great achievement. But alongside that, the akhlaq of Imam al Hussein is vital. The akhlaq of the children of Zainab, the children of Ruqayya, that akhlaq is something that needs to be studied. That these sons, instead of them saying that, you know what, I want to get out of here, why have you bought us here, and so on. On the contrary, there is this unbelievable obedience towards their mothers. When the mothers say, are you ready to go and serve? That's number two. Number three, before we get into the analysis, the third thing is the unbelievable sadaqa jariya for Abu Talib alayhi salam. If anyone doubted where Abu Talib would be on the day of judgment, come and look at the grandchildren of Abu Talib. Abu Talib alayhi salam's grandchildren are all over Karbala. We know that there are some schools in Islam, non-Shia, who say Abu Talib is a kafir. Abu Talib will burn in hell. In Karbala, you had a tent for Aqil, a tent for Ja'far, a tent for Ali. Abu Talib's sons, all of them, one way or the other, had grandsons at Karbala. If this was Abu Talib, a kafir, then look at the legacy of Abu Talib alayhi salam. One angle, you'll see Abdul Rahman, the son of Aqil, son of Abu Talib. Aun, son of who? Son of Ja'far. Or you have, for example, Aun, son of Abdullah, son of Ja'far, from one side. You have Aun, son of Zainab, son of who? Aun, son of Zainab, who becomes the daughter of Ali, son of Abu Talib. Look at Abu Talib's legacy at Karbala. Every single angle, Abu Talib has a sadaqa jariya for him. In other words, chilling in Jannah. Because there are those who admit that shafa'a comes for you from maybe your sons or your grandsons. If shuhada Karbala are going to be the masters of Jannah, then I'm sure they'll look after their granddad as well on the day of judgment. So what you have there for, when you come to this particular moment, 135 on the 10th of Muharram, it is now the turn of the young ones of Bani Hashim. The young ones who are with Imam al Hussein, who are not shying away. They're not saying that because I'm 8 or I'm 10 or I'm 12 or I'm 16, that I cannot be religious. This is a vital point. Sometimes you have some parents who are like, Baba, you want to make them a Maulana from a young age? Let them enjoy life. Let them taste life. Let them see what life's about. That is Kalimat Haqq. It's a truthful comment, but its intention could be wrong. I can, should see the potential in my children from a young age that they should be the best in Quran and that they should be the best in what? In their knowledge of Islamic history. They should be the best in Arabic grammar. Why? Because the combination of all of these was in Karbala. When you study Zainab salam's son in Karbala or sons, when you study them, it's not just because they're the sons of Zainab that they become great. Anyone could be the child of a prophet and end up being a kafir. Nabi Adam's son, Qabil, was a kafir. Don't we agree? Nabi Nuh's son died as a kafir. Just because your dad or your mom, for example, is religious doesn't mean you come out. What we've never done when we look at Aun. None of us have looked at the ziyarah of our 12th Imam for Aun, son of Zainab. Who is Aun, son of Zainab? When you teach your kids about Aun, what do you tell them? Who's Aun? Who is Abdullah bin Muslim bin Aqil? Who's Abdul Rahman bin Aqil? Who's Muhammad bin Muslim bin Aqil? Who are all these young ones of Bani Hashim? Do we know anything about them? 
How have they been described by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt Because our kids and this generation, they need role models. And they need people they could look at and say, you know what? I want to be like own Muhammad, Abdul Rahman, Abdullah bin Muslim and Aqil. I want to be like them. Many of us have portrayed these as young, emotional children who are like, mommy, can I fight? Yes, okay, you can fight now, go out. No, 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 no. They had reached a level of wisdom because their parents put immense effort in their upbringing. But what do we know about them? How much can we understand about them? Let's look at some insight as to this period on the 10th of Muharram to understand how much of a trial it was for the young ones of Bani Hashim. Ali al-Akbar, as the maqtal I narrated at the beginning says, Ali al-Akbar, when he died at around 1.30 p.m., as you know, by the way, when you look at a night like this, if you were Iraqi, then tonight the musibah should be Abel Fadl al-Abbas. And if you're Khoja, then tonight should be Qasim ibn al-Hasan. And if you're me, then I stick by chronology. And if I stick by chronology, then Qasim's turn has not come yet. And nor has Abu al-Fadl come yet. At 1.30 p.m., Ali al-Akbar alayhi salam, when he fell, was the first of many Hashim to fall in Karbala. When he fell, look at what the maqatil say. Imam al Hussein took his blood. How much pain Imam al Hussein was in, he threw it in the air. And none of it came back. As if it was a sacrifice accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment Imam al Hussein gathered the pieces of his son's body, which I say only here while my heart is shattered as I say it, wallah. He gathered the pieces of his son's body, he placed them in a cloth, and then he came and he called out, come and help me take this back. Say the shuhada, how strong he is, he needs help carrying Akbar's body. That only a father can know the feeling of if you were to see your child or a mother see their child die in front of them. When the ladies saw, this is a vital point. When the ladies saw, the first thing that the ladies did was what? Was they begun to beat their chest. Today people ask us, why do you Shia beat your chest? You ask this question. Sometimes the question comes from even Shia, not just outside of Shia. Sometimes even our own Shia will say, why do we beat our chest? Firstly, this azadari of beating the chest happened in Karbala in the tents of the ladies. The ladies beat their chest. How you beat your chest, of course, is up to you. You want to beat your chest softly. You want to beat your chest with some more passion. That's up to you. That's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reality is that when we beat our chests, we either do it because we follow the teachings that happen in Karbala of those ladies who beat their chests, or because we remember the chest of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. This is a vital point. But sometimes when you beat your chest, you remember the chest of Abba Abdullah and the way the horse is trampled all over it. Whatever way we beat our chest, we'll never be able to empathize with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. But the ladies, the first thing they did is they began to beat their chest. Or in some might talk about latimatil wujuh, maybe even slapping their faces. Then they began to do what? Then they exposed their hair. Now someone says, what do you mean they exposed their hair? Nashirat al-shu'ur is a line that sometimes we see mentioned even in ziyara literature. Exposing their hair, what does it mean? Yes, they let their hair out, but not in front of Umar bin Sa'ad's army. Amongst each other in the tent with those mahram to them. Because there are some who say that these ladies, they use their hair to cover their faces and so on. No. In the tent, the Arabs had this thing. If your hair was tied in a bun, normally it means that you're in a happy position. If you let your hair out, it means you're disheveled. Someone dies, you let their hair out. You're unkempt because someone from your family has died. When the maqtal says that the ladies let their hair out, the ladies would never let their hair out in front of those who are not mahram to them. Never. These are the ladies of Al-Muhammad. They are the very embodiment of piety. Never would they do that. But in the tent, yes. If I am, for example, Rabab, Zainab, 
and others, and I'm around a group of ladies, then there's no issue whatsoever, for example. And if Imam Zain al Abidin say is injured because of what has happened to him, Imam is amongst them as their son or their nephew. So only with those who are mahram, Ali al-Akbar alayhi salam's death made them let their hair out, made them beat their chest, made them begun to cry loudly. Crying is one thing, it's a sunnah. But to cry loudly is also a sunnah of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. The moment this ended, who came out on the battlefield? The first of the young ones was Abdullah, the son of Muslim bin Aqil. Muslim bin Aqil had a number of sons at Karbala. Some of them survived. Some of them got killed. Of those who came out was Abdul Rahman bin Muslim. As soon as he came out on the battlefield, young man, unbelievable upbringing. His mom, Ruqayya, Imam Ali's sister. That Ruqayya had already known a few weeks earlier that Muslim bin Aqil had been killed. Imagine the strength of this mum, the first mum of the mums of this night that we honor. And no one ever mentions her. People forget this lady. Her became a widow before all the rest of them became widows. She lost Muslim bin Aqil. And that Ruqayya had her daughter Hamida. She had her kids. And all of you heard my masaib a few nights ago that some of her kids ran away on Shama Gariban. Bibi Zainab said to them, get out, run, see where you reach because those horses are about to kill you. And that lady had to see her kids. Imagine that your kids are with you. They're running from one tent to another because it's being burnt. And then those kids all of a sudden run away. That lady Ruqayya, she looked at her boy Abdullah and she said to him, make me proud, please. Go out and do what you can for the imam of your time, not for my brother. There's a difference. The ma'rifah, that's not my brother Hussein. that's my imam. Abdullah, you ready to go out? And he looked around and he said to his mom at that moment, yes, I am. And he came out on the battlefield. When he came out, he looked in front of everybody. And he says these lines which are remarkable for someone A, young, B, thirsty, C, about to face 30,000 soldiers. I wish Allah gives us all that yaqeen in our life when we face death. He looks out in front of all of them and he's like, Al-Yawma alqa musliman wa huwa abi. Allah, it's unbelievable. This is unbelievable. Today, I look forward to meeting Muslim. That's my dad. You'd think that someone that young would be like, you know what, I'm going to get killed here. This is the end of me. What? That's a mother who's raised her son loving Ahlul Bayt. And like I said in yesterday's lecture, if death is the bridge that I have to cross to meet Imam Al-Hussein, why am I scared of death? <laughs> Unless... This Imam al Hussein talk, talk, talk is not the real me. I should look forward to death because if I die and I could get to Barzakh and, and see say the Shuhada, then I'm looking forward to it. Today is the day I meet Muslim, my father. Yes. And meet others who have died on the path. Of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. See the way they view death? Death for them is not scary, snakes, grave, narrow. Death for them is, I can't wait to see all those people I admire. Imagine I can chill with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Our perception of death, scary. Their perception of death, another dimension that I've got across. But I'm going to actually meet those people who I admire. And now I'm going to be able to ask them questions and talk to them and listen to them. He fought valiantly. He came out on the battlefield, fought unbelievably. But his death was a very difficult one. Imagine he's tried to defend himself. And the arrow hits his hand and his forehead. And he can't move it now. And what kills him is maybe I've let Imam al Hussein down. And he tries his hardest to move his hand. The maqtal says, when he tries to move his hand, he can't until the person by the name of Yazid bin Ruqad throws a spear directly into his heart. 
Just before that, he had shouted out, Ya Allah, these people outnumbered us and they humiliated us. Kill them in the way that they've killed us. What then happened is unbelievable and is hardly ever mentioned. The moment he fell, four young men ran out on the battlefield, not ran out to collect his body. They just ran out to make sure that they fight in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Of these four, two are the ones we know and two are hardly mentioned. Of those two that we know are obviously the names that we mention in Masa'ib, Aun and Muhammad. They are from one side, their father is Abdullah, son of Ja'far al Tayyar. Ja'far al Tayyar, if you're looking at the higher echelons, of Shi'ism, Ja'far al-Tayyar is literally in the higher echelons. The man who flies with wings, companion of Rasulullah, cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and brother of Imam Ali. Ja'far's son Abdullah married Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam. Where did they get married? Or this Abdullah, where was he born? Abdullah bin Ja'far, Aun's father. He was born, he was the first Muslim to be born in which country? Yes, Africa. The first Muslim to be born in Africa was who? Was Sayyidah Zainab's husband. He was the first to be born in Africa and he married Sayyidah Zainab السلام, at a very young age. He was around 16, she was 10. And you know Fatwa Zahra was married at 9. And in that time, those types of marriages, marrying in those age was not seen as something which is out of the culture. He marries her this Abdullah bin Ja'far, I wouldn't say is the greatest of the Shia, but nor would I say is the worst of the Shia. Please understand my point. He had a high respect for Imam Ali السلام, his uncle and his Imam, and he fought with Imam Ali at where? At Jamal, at Safin, at Nahrawan. But he was always someone who also had relations with all groups. And this person, when you look at his biography, you see that him and Sayyidah Zainab had a number of children with each other. Bear with me on this delicate point. In terms of Aun, Aun is definitely the son of Sayyidah Zainab salam. That the historians have no doubt about. In terms of Aun, everyone agrees that that is one of the sons of Sayyidah Zainab with Abdullah bin Ja'far. They had a number of children with each other. If we say that Sayyidah Zainab at Karbala was how old? How old was Sayyidah Zainab at Karbala? She was 55 years of age at Karbala. Imam al Hussein was 57 years of age. Aun and Muhammad are 11 and 9 or 12 and 10. Begs the question why would Bibi take so long to have kids? Because then that would mean that she has children. Maybe the children that she has, people can get pregnant, of course, in their 40s. And that someone could argue that Sayyidah Zainab got pregnant in her 40s and that's when she had her kids. But a 55-year-old with a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old, if they're around that age, question is, where's the others? And there were other children that they had. Those were not the only two children that Zainab and Abdullah bin Ja'far had. They had other sons and they had other daughters. They had a daughter by the name of Umm Kulthum who was way older than Aun and Muhammad. Hardly we mention her in our majalis. But Sayyidah Zainab السلام, had elder daughter by the name of Umm Kulthum and an elder daughter by the name of Umm Abdullah. So what do we have? We have Umm Abdullah and Umm Kulthum, elder daughters of Zainab. This Umm Kulthum, by the way, daughter of Sayyidah Zainab, Muawiyah, when he was in power, Muawiyah wanted her for Yazid. Muawiyah wanted her for who? For Yazid. Muawiyah's governor in Medina at that time was Marwan ibn al Hakam. Muawiyah's governor of Medina, Muawiyah said to him, Marwan, I want Zainab's daughter. Why? It's political relations. 
I mean, they knew that there are certain marriages which are political marriages. He's like, I want Zainab's daughter. What I want you to do, take a proposal. And I want you to say the following things in the proposal. The first thing that I want you to say is that Mahar Unlimited. Whatever dowry they want, I'm ready to give. Second thing I want you to say is that I want to quash the problem between us and Bani Hashim with this marriage. Us and Bani Hashim have had issues for years. If Zainab's daughter, Um Kulthum, her eldest daughter, marries Yazid, then we forget about the issues that we've had all of these years. So he looked at him. He said, no problem. I'll go to Abdullah bin Ja'far. Abdullah bin Ja'far seemingly has good relations with Muawiyah and he has good relations with his brother-in-law, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Abdullah bin Ja'far, when Marwan comes to me, says, there's a proposal from Sham. He said, from who? He said, Amir al Mu'mineen Muawiyah. He has proposed, this is bad, you know, in Islamic history is... Anyway, Muawiyah, he said, Amir al Mu'min Muawiyah has proposed for Yazid, for your uh, daughter, Um Kulthum. Do you accept? Abdullah bin Ja'far said, look, the decisions for who me and Zainab's children marry is with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. That is the Abdullah bin Ja'far where there is a very positive level to him. Yes, this is one of his great attributes. Now he said, Aba Abdullah is the one who decides Imam al Hassan at that time had died. And Imam al Hassan died about 10 years before Karbala. If we say that this Umm Kulthum, let's just say at the youngest, 13, 14, she's going to be where? In her 20s. That is more feasible that Bibi Zainab would not wait until her 40s to have a child. More feasible that she would have had a child before. Anyway, when Abdullah bin Ja'far comes to Imam al Hussein, he says, Imam, this is years before Karbala, after Imam Hassan died before Karbala. He says to him, Imam, there is a proposal. It's a proposal from who? He said, a proposal that has come for our daughter, Um Kulthum. We have our daughter, Um Kulthum. They had a son called Abbas. They had a son called Ja'far. They had Aoun and so on. Said, a proposal has come for our daughter, Um Kulthum. He said, from who? He said, from Yazid. Muawiyah is proposing on behalf of his son. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam said, No, let me go and talk to the girl and I will take the proposal to her. Notice Imam al Hussein leaves us with a great lesson here. Doesn't matter how awful the proposal is, in Sharia you still have to tell your daughter. It is haram for a person if someone proposes for their daughter not to tell the girl as much as you hate the guy. But there are fathers who of course will not say because me and mom have said he's not good enough. What does the girl think? My daughter will never like him. Baba, she's not your young girl anymore. Firstly, she's grown up. Secondly, there is a type of girl who wants to get married very young and there's a type of girl who wants to study and get married later. Two different types. No, mine will study. Maybe yours wants to just, his maternal instincts wants to get married and have kids. But the proposal from anyone must be taken to the daughter. You cannot turn around and say, we don't think he was good enough for you. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, who is more knowledgeable than anyone, could have easily said Yazid. Yazid for Sayyidah Zainab's daughter. No chance. No. He went to Umm Kulthum. He said to her, there's a proposal for you. She said, and who is it from, uncle? Said from Yazid. When he said from Yazid, he could tell that she had no interest. He said, look, on our side, we wouldn't recommend. There's a difference between Imam forcing the daughter versus Imam recommending. Imam said, we wouldn't recommend because of what? Because of the fact that we don't believe that they have religion. And they have no akhlaq. That's what we differ with them on. If they say to you that they want to offer the highest mahar, we are not in need. And number two, my father left me a great inheritance. A piece of land called the Bughaybara. 
I will give it to you as your mahar if you marry Qasim, son of Muhammad ibn Ja'far al-Tayyar, your first cousin. I will look after your mahar. She said to him, uncle, you are the one who decides for us. If you think that I'm fit for my cousin Qasim ahead of Yazid, then so be it. Marwan, by the way, at the time, Marwan was super confident that this would go through. So Marwan comes, he gives the khutbah, and he says, I'd like to make an announcement. Amir al muminin of Sham has made an announcement that Yazid wants Zainab's daughter, Umm Kulthum. Imam al Hussein then stands up and says, and we have an announcement that Umm Kulthum, daughter of Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, will be married to her cousin Qasim, the son of Muhammad, the son of Ja'far al-Tayyar. Marwan looked at him. He said, you've deceived us, Bani Hashim. Imam replied to him with something very interesting. Imam said to him, understand one thing. Us and you, Bani Umayyah, I don't have a personal issue with you. You are someone, we are someone, personally. But religion-wise, we believe you have no religion. And that you've got nothing to do with religion. And therefore, that's a line between us and you. We will not give our daughter, the daughter of Zainab alayhi salam, to someone with no deen like Yazid bin Muawiyah. Straight out. He comes nowhere near us. So for Abdullah bin Ja'far, on the one hand, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had his highest respect that Abba Abdullah decides something, not me. On the other hand, why Abdullah bin Ja'far? Why did you not come to Karbala? Why? You know, this is a difficult one, this one. Why? Because as a lecturer, I don't want to put tuhma on anyone. When on the day of judgment, I could be saying the wrong thing. But why your sons are at Karbala? Your wife is in Karbala. Why are you not there? Abdullah bin Ja'far. Let's see the answers. The first answer they say is because Aun and Muhammad's dad was blind and therefore he couldn't be at Karbala. But even then, he lived 19 years after Karbala. There's no real proof that he was blind. So it's not blind. Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas, we know was blind. But this Abdullah bin Ja'far, he was not blind. Number one. Number two, some people say Imam al Hussein left him behind to look after what? To look after the deposits and the properties of Ahl al-Bayt But that we can see for Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, but we cannot see that necessarily with Abdullah bin Ja'far. So what's the third answer? Third answer comes in the literature. The literature is unfortunately scathing on Bibi Zainab's husband. How? He tells Imam al Hussein when Imam is in Mecca, having left Medina, he writes to him, and he says to him, don't continue further. I advise you. It is better that you stay where you are. These people are not going to do anything for you. And if you want, I will go to Yazid and I'll get security for your wealth and your possessions. Imam al Hussein wrote back to him and he said to him that I saw my grandfather in my dream. Telling me to proceed with this command, whether the command is against me or whether the command's for me. And as for him saying that Yazid, I can get amana or security from Yazid, he said, These people, even if I'm in the depths somewhere, they'll pull me out to try and kill me and they'll break their covenants like the people of the Sabbath broke their covenants as well. Abdullah bin Ja'far, how could you advise Imam al Hussein? How? Imam say something who are you to come and say this is my advice this is something that he regretted because after Karbala when the news came to him of what took place there was someone who was working there by the name of Abu Laslas he was working for him he said to him what did Hussein achieve for us with this Karbala what achievement did he make for us with this Karbala and then Abdullah bin Ja'far picked up a shoe that was next to him. He threw it on him. He said, don't say that about Imam al Hussein. I should have been there. I wish I was with him in Karbala. Yet I at least had my sons with him in Karbala. 
As for the sons, as I mentioned earlier, these sons, some of them are from Sayyidah Zainab, some are from other wives that he had. Because sometimes people imagine Aun and Muhammad are both from Sayyidah Zainab. In my research, Aun and Aun is definitely from Sayyidah Zainab and Abdullah bin Ja'far. Whereas Muhammad is the son of Abdullah bin Ja'far, but from another wife. His wife, Khawsa, Muhammad is from that wife, but he is known as Muhammad bin Abdullah bin Ja'far. So some people, you know, if Sayyidah Zainab raises you or brings you up, it's like you're like her son. It happens, and it's nothing wrong. But biologically is one thing, someone raising you, because you are related to another wife is another. But when you look at the ziyara, our 12th Imam in the ziyara, where he talks about Shuhada Karbala, he praises own son of Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. And in his praise, of course, of Muhammad as well. Both of them are praised by him for their position. But when he praises own son of Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, he praises him with two things. Imagine an Imam praises you with these two. Number one, Halif al-Qur'an. He is the partner of the Qur'an. Allah. He's not just Zainab's boy. He's the partner of the Qur'an. Many times when we talk about our Imam, don't we say Sharik al-Qur'an? Assalamu alayka ya sahab al-Zaman, Khalifa al-Rahman, Sharik al-Qur'an. Number one about him is that his mother Zainab, from the beginning, Qur'an she instilled in him. From the beginning. That the Qur'an would not separate from him. The second thing that she instilled in him was what? That he was, according to our Imam, Musar al-Shaj'an. He was the one who used to be able from a young age to wrestle with even the bravest. And if you have an uncle like Abbas alayhi salam, then how are you not able to wrestle with the bravest around you? Yes, because those two... And the others who were there were very close to Abbas bin Ali. Very close. Because when that Abdullah bin Muslim fell, Aun, Muhammad, and then Muhammad bin Muslim, Abdul Rahman bin Aqil, the four of them, I want you to imagine four young men in Karbala. And the four of them were ready at that moment to come out together on the battlefield. Yes? And even he himself, just in case you don't know me, what does he say? If you don't know me, I am who? I'm the son of Ja'far. Ja'far al-Tayyar alayhi salam. Those of you on the opposition who don't know me, I'm the son of Ja'far al-Tayyar. The martyr who was truthful, who is now in the heavens, he got ready to come out, his brother with him, the other two with him. As they were about to come out, they looked around towards their mother Zainab alayhi salam. And the others looked at their mother Ruqayya alayhi salam. And imagine these boys, there's still a relationship with their moms. They don't want to separate. They want to be there alongside their mothers. They look towards their moms. The moms could do one of two things. Either the moms could tell them, come here, come back. Or the moms could say to them, make our mother Fatima al-Zahra proud. Yes? Because that's all they wanted. If you look at the words of all these moms, the mom we honor tomorrow, and the mom we honor on the day after, and the mom we honor on the day after, all the lead up, they all had one thing they wanted. That Fatima al-Zahra is proud of what they raised. And that at the end is the wish of every mother. Every mother hopes that she is able to raise sons and daughters on the path of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Imagine the scene therefore at this moment when one of the mothers, when she wanted to be certain about Aun, about Muhammad, are you definitely going to be there? Are you definitely going to deliver? And one of them turned around and said, Mom, don't worry about us. From one side, we are the grandchildren of Ja'far al-Tayyar. 
And from the other side were the grandchildren of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. As they approached the battlefield, Muhammad protected Aoun and Aoun protected Muhammad. And each and every one of them went out trying to protect the honor until all of a sudden one of the opposition came out towards Muhammad and began to attack him. When he began to attack him, he began severely towards him. Aoun put his body on the way, then Aoun was struck. Muhammad put his body on the way until the both of them lay on the ground. They called out, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. Imagine the scene for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. The Imam ran out on the battlefield. He saw these two boys with their cousins lying on the earth of Karbala. When he came, he collected looked at them. He came back towards the tent. He wanted to glance at the eyes of Zainab alayhi salam. He wanted to look at her, but she wasn't looking at him. Why? Because she never wanted to break his heart. Yes? She wanted to make sure that Hussein would, could remain strong because she knew one thing. If she broke down, he would break down. Why? Both of them had seen their mother Fatima die in front of them uh, and both of them had seen their father Ali die in front of them uh, and both of them had seen Imam al Hassan die in front of them uh, therefore when he came back Zainab did not cry at that moment uh, Zainab mashallah to the credit of Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam uh, she never once mentioned her boys yes not at all uh, even when she was taken towards Kufa not once did she cry for her boys uh, when she was taken to Sham, never did she mention her boys, yes? When she came back to Karbala, never did she mention her boys. Only when she returned back to her house in Medina, when she entered the house, she went towards the bedroom of the boys and she saw two empty mattresses on the ground. It says if she said at that moment, my dear boys I would have cried for you but I had to remain strong for Imam al Hussein. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with the Imam of our time Imam sahib al Asri wa zaman Allow us to be amongst his companions Ya Allah and those who follow his message in this world and the hereafter the originators of this majlis, Ya Allah, bless them with the intercession of Muhammad and Al-Muhammad. There are many who have asked for dua as well as Surah Al-Fatiha. In terms of those who have asked for dua, let us all together recite the verse of the Quran, all of us in one voice, for those who are feeling unwell, for those who face difficulties. There is someone here who has asked us to recite a dua for their daughter who is pregnant and facing difficulties all those who have asked us let's all recite together with one voice bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim amma yujibu al-mustar idha da'a wa yakshifu us all together amma yujibu al أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء In terms of those who have asked us to recite Surah Al-Fatiha there is brother Muhammad Radha Mu'min in Atlanta, his father Al-Hajj Noshad Mu'min passed away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless his soul. As well in Ottawa in Canada, a young man at the beginning of Muharram passed away by the name of Hussein, son of Firas Hammam. May Allah bless his soul and give sabr to his parents died at a very young age in the beginning of Muharram. And it's a very difficult time for his parents having lost this young boy but may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him the intercession of the young ones who died in Karbala we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Surah Al-Fatiha in their honor but before it the loudest of your salawat